Good evening. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, welcome you all for the Nature Education Webinar Series 5. So, uh, we'll just have a small introduction about our resource person, Hayat Muhammad. Shanti, are you ready? Hi, yes, sir. Yes, please introduce our RP to the audience. Thank you. Welcome all. Good evening, everyone. I'm very happy to introduce Hyatt, sir, to all of you. Sir is professionally IT employee and native to Bangalore. Sir have passion towards nature, especially in insects and butterflies. Hyatt, sir, is uses microscopy as a means of exploration and as a mode of showcasing many wonders of the arthropod world to the human world. It's our pleasure, sir, you are along with us today. Welcome once again, sir. Welcome all. Thank you. Thank you. The pleasure is all mine. Yes, welcome once again, Hayat. Uh, shall we start uh, as it is six o'clock? Uh, sure, we can begin. Uh, thank you, WCG Bangalore and everyone for giving me this opportunity. And first of all, I would like to apologize for having rescheduled this from yesterday. Something just came up that I could not uh, avoid. It's okay, it's okay. Sometimes it happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, so I'll probably uh, not take too much time and let's get this started. Let me know uh, once you're able to see my uh, screen. All right. Let me know once you're able to see my screen, please. Yes, yes. yes. All right, yeah. All right, uh, so here's what I have grown very fond towards. Okay, before that, let me just give a very, very, very short brief introduction about myself. Uh, I'm Hayat, like um, I was introduced, uh, born and brought up in Bangalore with a lot of uh, open spaces. So playing cricket and other things, I would also uh, spend time in the Parthenium and other uh, shrubs around. So seeing all the beetles, the grasshoppers, everything else sort of fascinated me. And growing up and having my own uh, digital camera let me explore things in a much more detailed sort of way. And then the social media, Indian Nature Watch and a lot of other uh, connects uh, has helped me sort of uh, gain, I wouldn't say knowledge, but at least insight in terms of uh, why certain things happen in nature the way they do. And this is my way of sort of propagating and keeping that spark alive going forward. Yeah, again, not a trained scientist. If there are any errors, I would like to apologize first and always open for correction. All right, uh, so before we begin, let's just go ahead and have a look at what actually a insect entails, right? So the first thing is uh, at a very basic level, uh, the antennae for, like uh, we've got our uh, sensory organs, say that they also have uh, several things to uh, get in a lot of, uh, ec what do you say, sensory feedback from the external world, right? So the, some of them being vision. So some have uh, compound eyes, some of them have uh, antennas, and they also have this very interesting thing called the ocelli, ocellus or the ocelli. So these are, uh, very basic eyes, which allow the insect to sort of judge the intensity of light is what I had uh, checked last on. And then mouth parts for feeding. Uh, some of the limbs in terms of uh, having the head, the head, thorax and the abdomen, right? And uh, some of them also have this very interesting thing called the spiracle through which they're able to uh, breathe. So some also develop wings uh, in their adult form. So this is a very basic thing in terms of, uh, since I did not know the kind of uh, audience I had, I just want to keep this a little basic and sort of uh, build it from there. Yeah, so, so for the ones who know, I hope I'm not uh, boring you too much. 
Uh, Nagesh, I would uh, like somebody just to have a, a audio feedback just to ensure my line is okay once in a while. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes, Sayed. Sure. All right. And uh, there are several orders. So uh, basically divided into very uh, high level 28 orders. So this is what I intend to sort of uh, glance through at the top level and then get to what actually makes them special. Why we have to observe what it is that, why is observing them so important? Why is recording them so important? And what they do to the whole ecology and how they play important roles. So that is something which I wish to, uh, I wouldn't say impart, but at least discuss in this forum. Yeah, just to start off. Uh, so here's a uh, robber fly on the left. So we spoke about uh, compound eyes. You can actually see these very specific ones, right? So each of these have uh, work like uh, individual optical cells, which project a complete image overall. And you've got uh, very faint antennae in this case and uh, feeding mouth parts. And on the right, we have a jewel beetle, right? So in this case, uh, the beetles actually have, you can see the three specific body parts, right? You have the head, thorax, and the abdomen, right? And on the ab abdomen is where they have their wings. And the beetles, they have this, uh, outer protective uh, covering over their wings, which may, which may lends them, so it sort of uh, helps them protect their very delicate uh, wings. And those, these wings, believe it or not, fold like origami. So when you actually see beetles in flight, their wings are a lot larger than their body size. So this could also be in a form of evolution just to help them manage their bulk and also make a quick getaway when needed. And on to the next thing. Here is a close-up of a assassin bug, right? So some of these, uh, if you actually see, they do not have a um, probus proboscis-like uh, feeding apparatus. So what makes these really special to observe and uh, document is this specific mouth part, right, which they use as a a feeding apparatus to one, inject the prey with venom or other, in fact, uh, digestive enzymes, right? So which go ahead and uh, liquefy the insides and then using the same straw-like apparatus, they suck up the insides, liquefied insides of the prey. And here you can also see the uh, very fine hair or the setae on the antennae, which help in better reception, so to speak, if I would like to put it in a pun. And onto the next uh, order, which are the orthoptera, the, those are the grasshoppers and crickets. So these again uh, is something which we've uh, seen very commonly around us. So if you actually begin to see, uh, we've, we all have kneecaps, elbows, right? You, and you've got that motion where you flex and are able to do this. So if you notice this, the hind legs, there's actually a proper uh, sort of a, what, hip and joint kind of a thing, which once straightens, helps them to leap forward in that direction. And to me, that is one of the most beautiful parts of uh, exploring stuff with uh, macro or close-up photography where you see some details and you just, you begin to ask questions which you generally would have not, have you had you not seen these details? So many people say, hey, you know, you know what? If you are a photographer, you're not a nature lover. I, I'd, I'd like to not believe that. Uh, for me, the photography is an extension of my, um, what do you say? Uh, inquisition into many of the wonders that nature holds. Uh, so the next one being uh, crickets, so you can actually see. So some of this, you actually had uh, feeding parts, but here you actually have some of the mandibles. So when, when you see them act independently, it almost looks very alien-like, where they are able to move that almost independently to clean and to gra uh, grasp on to prey when eating. So you're, uh, you're also able to see, it just out of focus though, but 
uh, you can still see the very uh, claw like gripping apparatus that they use all throughout Uh, so if anybody have any questions uh, and it's specific to that slide, you can go ahead and ask. Or if there are any generic questions, we can hold it off for the uh, end of the session. All right. Okay, I'll, yeah, go on, please. Uh, yeah, the photographs are really beautiful. Uh, could you, you please also tell us the um, name of the uh, insect? I mean, the name of that species. Okay, sure. Uh, the one, or oh, let me let me just uh, skip to. All right. Uh, so on the left is a robber fly. Okay. And on the right is a jewel beetle. Yes. Uh, this is a assassin bug nymph. Yes. Yes. Uh, so here is a monkey grasshopper nymph. So the oh. reason, the one of the easier ways to tell. Uh, nymph versus an adult is the lack of wings. So if you see, there's no wing, right, folded right. wing at the back. Okay. Yeah, and here's a close up of a, a really large cricket. Yes. Thank you. Sure, you're welcome. All right, and moving on to the- Sir, um, is that a, a field cricket or mole cricket? So this, I think, was a mole cricket, a really large specimen. Okay, sir, thank you. All right, and moving on to the next order, which are the, the true bugs. On the left is uh, Corridae, and on the right is what we call as the cotton stainer bug, right? And often what happens is, because the way these uh, wings fold and unfurl, they often come with these beautiful fingerprint-like patterns, and some of them look like masks. If you can just do a little bit of yoga and tilt your head 90 degrees and look at the one to the right, you'll actually see a mask kind of a demarcation on this, right? Two eyes and a nice little mustache. All right, and uh, moving on to the next order, which is uh, flies and bees. So you actually see these. Uh, so uh, when I was exploring all of this initially, when I took a one of the first detailed images, I was like, who really went and put shoelaces on top of it? Right? It's not shoelaces, so these are, and they're not stitched together, the two parts of the head. right? So these are essentially setae or uh, fine hair, which help in uh, sensory stimulus. So you also can notice the uh, compound eyes, and you notice all of the hair around this. So those are the hair that ensures this always gets away when you take a newspaper and try to swat it. Right, when you're trying to swat it, the setae pick up the movement much faster and it reacts a lot quicker than a mosquito. And on the right is a kind of a fruit fly. Again, you can see the uh, stunning eyes and the setae and the wing formation. Right, again, here's a tachinid. So you can actually see how uh, specifically they've got only uh, two set, two wings. Here's a pair of uh, mating musket flies, flesh flies. And here you, uh, anybody notice anything abnormal in this image? Do everybody look the same? in this image of uh, honeybees. There's one honeybee which is larger. Correct, and that's the uh, queen. Yeah. So okay. probably this would have been a, a colony that was on the move. So generally the queen does not uh, get out of the uh, colony so, so easily. What is the species name, sir? Episcloria, sir? I think this is the the uh, a combination in one apis i guess if you yes. if I'm not thank you all right any questions on this shall we move yes sir sure all right and then coming on to the next order which are the homoptera so this specific uh, 
order is something which most of the gardeners amongst us might really hate right so because they are very prolific and tend to uh, feed off the stems and feed on sap directly right so on the left are a bunch of uh, aphids and on the right there's one of the type of uh, scale insects so again scale insects by themselves are a pretty large very the uh, thing in terms of both form and structure they come in an Im- immensely mind boggling uh, variety all right moving on to the next one which is uh, the coleoptera which are the weevils and beetles so we did uh, talk about how the wings fold right so the wings fold under this thing called the elytra so the hard uh, structure around uh, covering the wings is called the elytra so here the on the right is a uh, one of the type of weevils and on the left is a mating pair of uh, tortoise shell beetles so you can actually see how wonderfully they have uh, specialized pp kits if you would want, want to call them right carrying their own umbrella just give me one moment please am i still audible yes yes yeah all right Uh, so is the slide back on now uh, you should be able to see a slide called uh, hymenoptera yes all right yeah so these again are uh, some of the bees uh, wasps and ants so in this here uh, pictured is one of the uh, thread wasted wasps a really dedicated parent that goes ahead and uh, plans in the future where it goes ahead and paralyzes any willing soft bodied prey which will be buried alive after uh, paralyzing it in some form a hole is dug uh, the unwilling host is buried alive and uh, after laying eggs into the abdomen right and uh, the wasp larvae when they hatch they have uh, ready made food waiting for them so they eat the host inside out and then emerge raw but that's what nature is all right and on to the next thing which is this i'm sure uh, any of us who wandered around broad leaved uh, trees quite a bit would have noticed these very industrial weaver ants weaver ants correct so here's the um, a slightly backlit image just to show how they use their power to fold or stitch to um, leaves together and then there are some workers who go back and bring their larvae to secrete the silk that is needed to go ahead and weave the leaves together and they truly are i think any ant for that matter is a epitome of uh, teamwork All right and moving on to the slightly more uh, glamorous insects <laughs> so I, for me all of them are pretty amazing and thing but uh, some people tend to have a slightly more softer corner for these so the lepidoptera which are the butterflies and moths Uh, so any guesses on what this is is it a moth or a butterfly anyone open wings right first a moth sure yes one of the german it's a moth yeah. correct and the next one being one of the um, common parrots so again a very tiny but extremely beautiful one which has these um, almost metal like shavings which is here and which is found a lot more on the common silver lines sir is it a small but a smallest in india uh no i think that goes to one of the small blues i think okay okay this is common period no sir that's correct yes yes uh, i would be preferred that's not to be called sir one. i am in nowhere <laughs> entitled to that title <laughs> 
hayat is plenty yeah all right so let's move on so uh, coming on to the next thing which are again uh, the odonata dragonflies and damselflies so here is a emerald spread wing with its uh, crazy neon colorations so uh, the other interesting bit about these are uh, is that uh, they need water to complete their life cycle and uh, they spend the majority of their life actually under water as believe it or not uh, supreme predators where they go after uh, various rotifers small fish tadpoles are all uh, welcome prey both the dragonflies as well as damselflies and here's a couple of uh, close ups on the left uh, is a um, this is a what and on the right again is i think one of the golden dart not a dartlet um i sorry i have been <laughs> i have just had a, a baby recently so i'm a little low on sleep so i'm unable to recall uh, specific names at the drop of a hat yeah and uh, both of these um the dragonflies as well as damselflies if you uh, um notice them in the field they actually have this very nice owl like uh, so the owls generally have a eye level kind of a axis of uh, turning their heads but these are able to turn it uh, looking upwards to the sky and back and again the um, compound eyes the really large compound eyes in, in fact compared to any other body mass i've seen uh, help them in becoming uh, extremely good aerial predators yeah and uh, next on is other mantises right so uh, these again come in a mind boggling variety all of them have this i'm pretty sure uh, mantids were the first creatures that um sprang to anyone's mind when they thought of uh, creating alien models right they look very crazy we've got the really large oversized eyes very tiny mouths compared to the whole body right and uh, on the left is a new mantis in the middle is one of the most common uh, hierodula species and on the right is one of the uh, grass mantises and they've got a, all of the mantises have extremely brilliant uh, and sharp vision and for that matter uh, because of how they react uh, they unfortunately also tend to be a little uh, sought after as pets across the world right and uh, this is another thing i'd like to share with you guys is uh many of them actually have a year located somewhere in this region at the uh, base of the uh, at the start of the abdomen somewhere yeah. which i found pretty amazing so i really thought insects didn't possess that kind of uh, external externally visible or externally audible kind of a thing but mantises apparently do anyone want to add anything here hayat uh, just a question sure uh, why it is called praying mantis uh, can you please explain ah, it is very sure. interesting i think absolutely yes uh, so we noticed all of the uh, various uh, resting positions of many insects so far right so we saw the um grasshoppers resting with their knees bent backwards flies when they sit they sit with their front legs and they jump backwards similarly these praying mantises uh, almost work in a pneumatic fashion just like spiders right where uh, the basic resting position is at uh, close to um, the resting position and the moment they have something in uh, within striking distance is when they can uh, put out the hand uh, for open up their legs really quick and grab them right and if you notice uh let me see if i have a, i've got any of the uh, downloads open okay. so just let me know if you able to see this 
it's your mantis image so you can actually see the very natural like legs which help in clamping on to prey really quick is this visible yes yes sir yes sir yeah so it's the flower mantis so uh, this is a flower mantis creobrota that's right yes. all right i'll move back if there are any further questions i can take them and uh, yeah just to uh, close the loop on that so the basic thing is where they keep the hands folded for ready striking and that looks like a praying position and that's why they call the uh, praying mantises yeah all right let's proceed I still have a lot of stuff to share with you guys. And then yeah. comes the other part where uh, something which has been really picking up pace uh, lately, which is studying of spiders. So, anybody want to quickly uh, tell me what are the three different uh, sections of an insect that we spoke of, just to see how many of them are awake at the end of the day? Anyone? Yeah, the abdomen, thorax, and the uh, uh, the head. Correct. Yeah. So what Mother Nature did with arachnids was essentially this, right? It just took the thing and did away with the necessity of her. Again, what was the what are the regions? Anyone? Head, thorax, and abdomen. Right. So the thorax. in uh in arachnids this was taken away and so they essentially have uh, this the head and the abdomen itself right so and the other differentiation uh between the insect categories and the uh, arachnids is the presence of eight legs whereas all insects have six right so some of the examples uh, of arachnids being mites scraps uh, spiders pseudoscorpions scorpion and the uh, some of the times we uh, see under uh, rocks and decaying material the vinegarones right and there's also this uh, additional thing so uh, if you notice if you see this right you'll actually count it's not 8 but it's 10 right 4 plus 4 plus 2 so the additional two that you have here are actually the pedipalps so these are uh, modified parts which they are used for uh, sexual reproduction and in the case of males they almost have a boxing glove like kind of a uh, enlarged uh, structure so some eye patterns in terms of defining um which families each of the spiders belong to so this is a generic uh, uh look up in terms of eye layout so this helps in bucketizing what family they could possibly belong to and each of these come with specific uh needs and evolutionary uh, uh what do you say evolutionary specialization right with the saltisids which are the jumping spiders which i think most people would be very um, aware of uh, so the um, like you see the the size of the eye itself right is a lot larger so this helps in a little more of uh, binocular vision kind of a thing which provides that and there's also the additional ones uh, for all around vision and in case of the uh, ground spiders with a uh, low light again they have the lycosids and some of the other more common ones uh, we see around the house are the uh, falsids the cellar spiders right so this again can go into a detailed uh, session of its own so i'll probably not delve in too much into this right so some examples of uh, jumping spiders a uh, eps jumping spider on a windshield on the left and that is how many of my friends and family describe when they see a spider dude i saw a spider with too many legs and in this case that it's not too many legs it's just eight and all the others are just uh, 
internal reflections from the layers of uh, glass. And on the right, we have uh, we, are, we actually see the uh, Telamonia dimidiata females. Uh, so the larger ones uh, cannibalizing the smaller. Yeah, on the left, uh, we have a stunning Chrysilla male. And on the right, we have a Ox Oxyops Shweta with uh, one of its most favored babies. So you, we all have that, right? This is probably the most favored sibling in the lot, riding on the mother's back. Right, and uh, a quick gist in terms of uh, how the, there are two distinct stages, right? So some of them have a four-stage thing, and this is where we see what we call as a metamorphosis, where from eggs, larva is where the uh, time where they just are concentrating only on feeding and nothing else. And then once that's done, they go ahead and pupate, and out of the pupa comes the actual adult, right? So here's where the, we see the metamorphosis. But in terms of a three stage, and here's where we see young nymphs. So these nymphs are uh, essentially mini adult versions that get out. And it is that they lack wings as the adults. And as they grow, the uh, wings form. So from the egg, the nymphs uh, hatch. And from there, they undergo a series of instars, which are essentially uh, different stages of uh, growth through molting, and then finally, they reach the adult size. Any questions on this? Am I audible? No questions, yes. sir. Yes, yes, sir. yes sure. sir. audible. Sure. Can continue. Right. No questions. All right. OK, so now comes the more uh, interesting part. And I'd like to keep it a little more interactive if possible, yeah, and what makes these actually special, right? So there's so much, everybody come and ask, uh, why do you actually spend so much time photographing them, observing them, what is it that other life forms don't give you? I'm like, no, every life form has its own thing, but these uh, are a little more readily available and I there's just so little known about these. The more you read, the more you find out, the more fascinating it gets. Right, so the first one of the first is they have warning colorations, right? So color is often used in the natural world as a form of either uh, display or just to tell one potential predator saying, hey, you know what, I'm toxic and not really palatable. So here uh, a red ladybug or a ladybird as many call it, uh, displaying its uh, toxicity with bright reds. And these, as adults and also the uh, larval forms, they act as great uh, natural pest control for aphids and other uh, sap suckers. So they call this the gardener's best friend. Yeah, they also show a lot of uh, parental care. So here's, uh, assassin bug picture. So you actually can see all of the uh, egg structures bound together with a jelly-like thing. And the parent sitting right beside uh, guarding the whole bunch. Here's a Miotepa or a comb-footed spider with its freshly hatched uh, spiderlings, which emerged out of this egg sac. Right. So anybody new, so when we uh, talk about parental care, we often say, all right, it could be mammals, it could be spiders at most, even cockroaches. So in this case, a wood cockroach hides many of its uh, nymphs below its abdomen. So you can actually see a uh, mite hanging around there as well. Right, and uh, many spiders also do this, the most common ones being the uh, wolf spiders. So here you can actually see one of the wolf spiders carrying its uh, hatch or uh, spiderlings on its back. 
Right. So here's a very odd form of parental care, right? So we all think parental care means being there for when they hatch, taking care of them and their safety and all of this. Uh, here's the lace uh, being eggs, no, sir? Yeah, correct. So this is a green lace being uh, egg. Right? So what these guys, uh, one of the sources what they mentioned is they are so highly competitive and uh, voracious that they often cannibalize each other. So the way they've evolved is each egg contains one larva, right? And they because they're on a stock, it gives each of them a good fighting chance of not being cannibalized by its own sibling. All right? And so once you start thinking of that, you can't fathom how amazing the whole evolutionary journey might have been, right? A small insect having the capability to uh, draw out this really long protein-based uh, string and then lay an egg at the tip of it. For what? <laughs> to know that it's not supposed to go and predate on or uh, cannibalize its own siblings the moment it touches. One of the many mysteries and stuff which just keeps us all hooked. Yeah. So the next one we just spoke of uh, here is a tortoise shell beetle with its all own personal protection equipment. Right? We all hear the PPE thing quite a lot. Nowadays, yeah, so here's one with its own specialized thing. So you can actually see how translucent this whole uh, thing is, and you, you are able to see the whole uh, uh, split right down the middle. And this is what keeps the uh, folded origami rings within. Right, so we all think we were one of the first farmers, we were one of the first ones to live together in communities, but insects have been doing it for a much, much, much longer time. So here's a community of uh, paper wasps hanging around uh, during dusk. Right, and the other community is that we generally often don't see, but we only see the end result, which towers very high in our grasslands are these termite hills. So these are the blind termites that make all of that building happen. So I have a question here on the termite hills. No. Uh, so they're called bambies, no, in the northeast. Uh, um, they're usually sealed off. There is no opening in this termite hills, like, unlike the ant hills. Ant hills, there will be some kind of those holes wherein mm -hmm. sometimes the snake goes. But these uh, termite hills, they're totally closed off. Is there some reason or is there a colony inside? There always is a colony, I thought. I'm not, uh, sorry, qualified enough to answer that. But what I saw here was there was some sort of a, either they were still building or damage. And you can actually see these guys uh, try to seal it off. And they were working at a rapid pace. Okay. Uh, do these also colonies indicate there's a water body below? Uh, that I'm not sure. Sorry. Okay. okay. Thank you, sir. There's enough, uh, what do you say, I wouldn't say folklore, but I'm sure a, a lot of folklore is tied down to mm. um, unrecorded stuff. May, it very well might be. Okay, okay thank you. Sure. All right. And so some of the communities don't really have to be, uh, what do you say, a single... Yeah. Go on, please. I heard someone speak. All right. Uh, so here's a horn tree hopper, a membership with its uh, row of eggs. And what's happening here is uh, many of the ants will come and protect these in uh, exchange for honeydew that these uh, are capable of secreting. So these get protection, the ants get honeydew. Anybody want to uh, guess in terms of what this uh, phenomenon is called? Mutualism. Mutualism, that's right, yes. All right, moving on to the next thing is how they use some of their superpowers like blending in and vanishing, right? So uh, here's a wall 
crab spider blending in perfectly with the rock background so in many cases it is used not just to uh, line wait for uh, ambushing prey but also just to uh, not be visible you can't be eaten if you can't be seen right so that's essentially why they tend to hang around so and the other thing is some of these uh, green link spiders the way their structure is it matches that of the flower so perfectly right that they hang around and waiting in ambush for any um visitor on one of the flowers to come and they are snapped up like that so here is a i think this is called uh, i forget the name yeah it's a psyllid uh, citrus psyllid so here's what happens so some of the uh nymphs they have these very fuzzy like fuzzy um outcrops or whatever thing that they produce from sugar very much like a fat candy floss and the uh, honey dew is often tended to by other ants so the winged one you see here is a, actually an adult form all right on to the next is uh yuri bracade nymph on the left on a bark matching the tones and the textures so perfectly and on the right we have a uh, what is called the uh it's a nymph of one of the things that you find on uh avrekalu uh what's the thing called i forget the name sorry All right. So here's the thing. So it is a nymph which sort of lies uh, motionless on one of the uh, on many of the barks of trees, and they're so flat till they actually move, you can barely notice them. Right. Second, hi. I have yeah. one question. Sure. Uh, have any of the colors been enhanced in your photographs, or is it exactly as you see it? Okay. Uh, so here's the thing. uh what i tend to use is a, a flash only system mm -hmm. where i want to show the maximum detail possible so i use with i work with uh closed apertures right and because the light is not enough mm -hmm. i use external flash and a uh, flash what it does is it adds some bit of micro contrast okay right so one is the visible spectrum and the other one is also the way the uh textures and the colors react to flash Mm. Okay, understood. Thank you. Sure. Right, and the other thing is, uh, we so far we spoke about how they try to evade, thrive by on their manner, and the other is where they go look for looking for uh, unwilling hosts to provide themselves a good uh, head start. So we uh, we saw a uh, wasp. go ahead and paralyze and carry the uh, caterpillar earlier so one of the others uh, is also this where uh, they go ahead and deposit the eggs on a living moth caterpillar most of the times and here in this case you can actually see the uh, pupae have emerged after eating the caterpillar inside out and they are ready to emerge from here as adult wasps Yeah, and here is a bunch of uh, pentatomidae eggs and i firmly believe for every size of egg there is there is a size of equivalent wasp which is making the most of the opportunity right and what they've also done is they've adapted to a host or a, rather any form that we're looking for be it underground be it on shrubs be it on trees be it on life on water so here's a water strider which is taking care of a weaver ant that had fallen on it on the water surface so some superpowers we were talking about right so uh, we spoke of how 
the large eyes, the anterior median eyes, the large eyes really help in really good vision. But they also have uh, fluid-filled bodies, which they work for pneumatic pressure. So the uh, so imagine we have pneumatic pressure within our bodies. and instead of bending the knee and jumping say probably 2 or 3 feet we can jump probably 10 or 15 feet so that's the kind of super power that fluid filled uh, body gives them so all of the joints they just have to like straighten and they are able to catapult ahead right carrying your own house that now that's a super power right wherever you want you can just vanish back in so here's a Bagua Moth Caterpillar, who apparently also did some bit of uh, architecture studies, knows how to cut down logs from going wide to tapering at the top. Right? Imagine you hanging uh, either using your hands or your jaws, biting down and sleeping in that position. so here the celioxis species uh, um leaf cutter which sleeps in this position where it just goes ahead and uh, locks down its mandible below and uh, hoists itself up to sleep yeah and so some of them also use very uh, interesting techniques so some beetles when threatened or uh, they want to make a really quick getaway will often feign death where they'll just roll off or act as a bear they've been capacitated in some form so you also see this whole thing of uh, do you also see the phoretic mites on this i zoomed in a little, little is that visible yes yeah so you actually see these they use beetles also for uh, their own form of transportation bus service right and they also the on the right top there's a, a rain jumping spider taking care of, taking its meal of a much larger neoscona male right and the way their legs are covered with very fine hair they also possess the capability to cross water without getting drenched So here's another. Uh, I couldn't ID the spider yet, crossing a small puddle. Right, and here is a vinegarone, or a whiptail scorpion, as some of them call it. Right. So believe it or not, both of these are the same species. On the left is a kantau. nymph and on the bottom right is where you see the adult form so you actually see right so this has sort of extended in and to cover the wings so the elytra is actually covering the whole uh, folded wings in so some nymph forms of the pentatomidae so these are freshly hatched and they tend to remain slightly reddish and as they react with the outside air they tend to go slightly brown and from this form to the some similar form of uh, this they will undergo many uh, moltings where they move from one instar to the other and finally in the final molt uh, get wings and emerge out as adults so here's a small uh, demonstration of how this gaudy grasshopper emerged out of its exoskeleton which is a perfect copy including the striations and texture so this is almost like a any of us who follow marvel would know like a iron man suit so to speak which they carry by themselves on on themselves all at all times so here is a dragonfly uh, nymphs which have emerged and from this hard exoskeleton is where the adult could have emerged on the left is where you see a cicada which is which is hard to believe that this whole body length was crammed into just that space and you can see the wings unfurl little by little and on the right is a two tailed spider which was just molting
Right. Any questions on the molting part? Because this can be pretty fascinating. Anyone? Uh, I Still have awake? a question. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Make no mistake about our being awake. No problem. <laughs> uh, I have a I have a small this one. How often does this molting occur? Does it occur at different intervals for different species, or do they all go according to the seasons? Uh, it's not according to the season. It's uh, based on how often they how how much they've grown, and their outer shell is actually limiting their growth. Okay, yeah, because so, I often come across the exuvium of uh, many of these, uh -huh. but uh, I was never sure uh -huh. what uh -huh. I should link it to. Yeah, so in the cicadas case, they just emerge out once and for all. In many of the other uh, nymphal stages, right, in these, right? So here they'll actually have uh, some molds, which is as soon as within 48 hours of hatching. Thanks, uh, Hayat. Carry on. Sure, sure. All right, and uh, so this the name still evades me. It is the same uh, nymph that we saw flattened out on the uh, bark earlier. Right, here's imagine you can't lift stuff, but you call enough of your friends, and the crazy orange giants taking out. Uh, dried uh, owl fly. So here's a very interesting thing which I included in the slide. Uh, this is called cycloalexy, where many of the larval form, uh, sorry, the pupil forms will uh, band together and try to minimize the risk from predators. So you can actually see all of them have sort of pitched their tents and some who came a little late to the party <laughs> and buzzed in between, I guess. So these, if you see, are the uh, uh, pupil forms of uh, uh, leaf beetles. So you can clearly see the eyes and the tucked in legs. Yeah, so we, sp we had seen the um, cocoons built by the larvae earlier. So here are some of the larvae still feeding on the dying uh, moth caterpillar. These are not grapes, by the way. <laughs> yeah, an amazing thing. We've all seen uh, mantises, we've seen lace wings, and here's this really amazing mix of both worlds called a layer mantis fly, where you actually see the this half, if you see, no, looks like a mantis with its praying mantis-like position and the lacy wings like that of a lace wing on the bottom half. Right? Uh, any guesses on what this is? Ant lion. Yeah, this ant is a, this a, lion. That's right, yeah. So there's an ant lion uh, larvae. So these, uh, if you uh, are in the field and notice some sandy areas, you'll see these conical structures that are dug up and these lie in awaiting uh, ants and other uh, insects which happen to fall into that trap. Here's a lobster moth caterpillar, very alien looking. And here you can actually see all the uh, spiracles that we spoke of earlier. You can see these breathing holes. Any guesses on what this is? Just a bunch of old carcasses and debris. So here's a lace wing larvae. Right. So now coming to the uh, part, sorry, somebody had questions? I thought I heard someone unmute. Right. I had, uh, one more. No. Say that again, please. Yes, sorry. from uh, again. Sir, is this a only effort? As in? No, no. Uh, I think it feeds off a lot of uh, different types. Uh, aphids are one of the known, uh, what do you say, preferred prey. Okay. 
ಹ್ಯಾತ್ ಐ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಒನ್ ಕ್ವಶನ್ ಆಸ್ ಯು ಟೋಲ್ಡ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಆಂಡ್ ಲಯನ್ ಒನ್ ಪಾರ್ಟಿಸಿಪೆಂಟ್ ಆಸ್ಟ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಪ್ಲೀಸ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪ್ಲೈನ್ ಹೌ ಆಂಡ್ ಲಯನ್ಸ್ ಆರ್ ಡಿಫ್ರೆಂಟ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಡ್ರಾಗನ್ ಫ್ಲೈಸ್ ಆಂಡ್ ಲಯನ್ಸ್ ಆರ್ ಡಿಫ್ರೆಂಟ್ ದನ್ ಡ್ರಾಗನ್ ಫ್ಲೈಸ್ ಎಸ್ all right uh, so one of the easiest ways to tell them apart is the eyes so the ant lions almost have a uh, what to say two section eye on each side there's like a upper lobe and a lower lobe and the antennae also uh, dragonflies don't have antennae whereas ant lions do right and they have a really long antennae at the end they have almost like a clubbed um blob so those i think are the easiest ways to tell them apart apart from the resting position again the owl flies will rest with their uh, wings completely down not just like a flattened thing of a dragonfly but completely down completely in rest position yes yes thank you thank you ayat you can continue sure. all right so coming to the thing in so i'm surprise nobody still are saying where all do you observe this so many of this has been uh, in and around bangalore for most of it and many in fact have been just been uh, in our uh, backyard garden right so the insect form doesn't really need much and that is once you start identifying observing all of this you actually understand how small or micro uh, one's comprehension of what we call as a ecosystem can be a ecosystem for many of these insects can just be one plant right right from host to uh, other uh, paras- uh, parasites coming in others who come to take advantage in terms of tachinid flies or being wasps which actively hunt for them so once you begin to understand all of that and then expand it to what we actually call as a ecosystem overall the scale is absolutely mind boggling and then we begin to understand why small actions can have huge impacts right many people say oh spider kill it with fire no spiders are your friends right many say oh there are aphids let's go get uh, uh pesticides and just spray it no there are much more easier ways of handling it through ladybird larvae right and where all do you observe you can observe it in your backyard you can observe it in a uh, open uh, patch around your place lakes are uh, generally hot spots because there's water involved and again this is there really is no end just like uh, birding or any other uh, forms of nature once you start to observe these there is no going back you will constantly keep seeing them everywhere yeah and then comes the next bit of once you've actually observed what do you actually do so if some of you can recall i had shown a image of a very colorful spider called the chrysella right and there was a newspaper article which had come in kerala not uh, not too ba in the recent history where they mentioned the chrysella was rediscovered after 180 years whereas everybody have been observing it day in day out so what happens is if you observe and you do not really go and record it silly stuff like that comes up everywhere so there are multiple platforms like uh, india biodiversity uh, portal and the i naturalist portal or app so you should actually just go ahead and uh, start documenting those so what that does is two things one opens up the possibility of uh, other seeing probably some undiscovered species which you might have just stumbled upon by pure luck and second also reinforce uh, if there's been any uh, change in habitat or uh, distribution of a certain species right so with that i would like to thank you all and i'll be open for questions now participants if you have questions you can just unmute and you can ask hi i think we would like to thank hayat first the <laughs> really i have always admired his images and uh, it's a treat to look at them and learn a few things thank you hayat 
thank you so much and pleasure thank you mine. wcg thank you for organizing this thank you thank you madam uh in chat box i have few questions hayat so sure, i'll go back to the chat and see if i can take some of those i'll probably stop presenting yes. yeah um, habitats also vary that's correct <laughs> deepa says bmtc will now stand for bugs mites transport corporation <laughs> that's a very witty one coming from <laughs> yeah all right um uh, one difference between moths and butterflies so uh, many of the moths will have uh, serrated antennae fuzzy looking antennae and the general resting position is something else. which i have generally seen i don't know the exact what you look for these are the uh, two things i generally look for just a second can i interrupt sure go on uh, yeah last uh, webinar was on moths uh, wcg which we conducted on natural national moth week it was on mm-hmm. moths sure so those who want to know the real difference and the uh, uh, species which are which we can see uh, commonly around us please you can go and watch uh, it is available in youtube wcg youtube channel you can go and uh, see there uh, there uh, you can see what is the difference between moths and uh, butterflies uh, so you can watch there yes i uh, sorry you can continue no problem no problem all right and rishma had a question what's the best time to look for out for these bugs right so again uh, they are found throughout the day and different types of night right and some of the easier times where them being cold blooded to observe them up close would be uh, earlier in the morning and later in the evening all right and there was another question from akshata life cycle is it really in when the young comes all right in the uh, cicada what happens uh, what we've seen in the field so far is uh cicadas once they finished mating the female will go ahead and look for a moist uh soil and lay eggs within the soil right so they fin- they uh, the larvae once they've hatched drill down and stay underground feeding off roots right and what you actually see as a um once they've emerged out is only the outer shell so there's no killing or thing that's involved i think some of uh, that is seen in some of the scorpions and spiders in some spiders it's called matriphagy where the female will give itself up as a first meal for the babies yep any more uh, common parrot sorry again not a butterfly specialist i'll have to pass that for a uh, purna prashna any more any more questions if you want to ask you can ask yes akshata has one question uh, so how different to differentiate shape. the moth and uh, butterfly cats uh, one uh, basic rule i've i won't say rule guideline i've generally seen is moth cats tend to be a lot more woolier if i could use that term right they have a lot more uh, sete or hair fine hair yes uh, if you have any questions you can ask do mantis fold their body while resting yeah in many do uh, in, in most cases rather than the whole body they re- they fold their uh, raptorial legs the front legs okay Uh, if you have any questions you can uh, send in chat box or you can unmute and you can ask okay no questions i think yes uh, i will call upon tejashwini to give vote of thanks to our participants and resource person tejashwini over to you yeah uh, is um, audible ana yeah you are going Yes. Yeah, yes. thank you so. So good evening everyone. I am Tejaswini JS 
and I am here to present out of thanks for today's webinar. I would like to thank our resource person, Ah Hayat Muhammad Sir, on behalf of WCT for enlightening us with the knowledge, and he made us to take a short journey into insects' world along with him. Thank you so much, sir. The point where Hayat Muhammad Sir told us about body division of insects, twenty-eight different. Uh, orders of insects, eye pattern, insect life stages, parental care, camouflage, adaptability was really informative. Actually, he listed many things, but uh, I have listed only a few. So once again, I would like to thank Ahayat Muhammad sir for spending their valuable time and presenting about today's topic, a kingdom hidden in plain sight. So thank you so much. For oh, the pleasure has been all mine, and I again I really apologize for having to reschedule this. WCG yes. and participants, thank you for hearing me out, sharing the uh, little joy that I have for this tiny insect world. And thank personally, I would like to say that really I love the photographs, whatever you captured. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, and I would like I would also like to thank Nagesh sir, Shanti Akka and the other WCG members for their constant support to make this event happen. Thank you all. Yes, thank you Tejashuni. I had one more question is there. Uh, sure. Uh, Reshma is asking, please suggest best option for macro photography. All right. So there are two uh, various different things, right? So one is uh, budget. The other is um, mobility. Right. So in terms of uh, if you look for the best of both worlds, for somebody to just start documenting something in their uh, backyards without having to spend too much, I would in fact suggest looking at any of these uh, macro clip-on lenses that you get for uh, mobile phones. Right. A smartphone is generally something which we all have handy on us most times. And just adding this lens on gives you, if not... Uh, groundbreaking quality at least in terms of recording and seeing something which is very interesting both for videos and stills it does work out great or there's also the other uh, the whole uh, range for it right from mobile phones to point and shoot cameras with close up capabilities to dedicated macro lenses on DSLRs and if you want to go the full gamut on the other side uh, you can also look for uh, uh, microscope objectives. So again, this can be a topic which I can talk for days on end. <laughs> so this, that's just to um, sum it up very shortly. Yes, uh, still uh, I have two more questions. Uh, shall yeah. I take up? Yeah, go on, go on, please. Probably another three minutes. Purna Pragna, Purna Pragna is asking, I have recorded 70 plus butterfly species in my back card but still some are very confusing. How to identify them? Uh, so this, there are uh, several things, right? So one was, uh, I found butterflies, I think they have an app using that, or even on, uh, if there's a clear enough image on that, you could upload to iNaturalist and the uh, AI capability on that is pretty decent where if not, um, Accurately, it'll tell you close enough in terms of what it could be. Uh, next, Raghavendra Siddhar okay. Murthy. I think uh, Raghavendra and Purnima also had the same questions in terms of field guide or a book 